And welcome to our 2016-2017 academic year, first of all, and to our fourth year of sponsoring the Teal Forums. And today, you probably saw as you came in, we are, we meeting the group of the Teal Forum Committee. We are very happy to celebrate our 150th anniversary of Teal, so you have ice cream cake. Uh, and since ice cream melts pretty quickly, we're going to be putting it away for a while, but when you leave, when we leave at 5 o'clock, you're certainly welcome to have more of it, okay? In keeping with our tradition of excellent presentations by our faculty and students that combine professionalism and personal experience, today's presenters have traveled far and wide and come back to us excited to share their experiences. So sit back and enjoy a panoramic view of multicultural richness. Hi, um, my name is Nicholas McNutt. I'm a senior here uh, with a dual major in neuroscience and psychology. Um, Mid-semester, mid-spring semester, I had a friend of mine, Dan Wegman, who's here in the audience actually, come up and say, hey, I have a project for you. Some guys want to get you involved. And I had no idea what this entailed, um, but then I met with Martin Black. Um, we have known each other before this, but he told me all about this crazy bike trip to Maine from here at Teal College, 775 miles predicted then away. Um, and what we wanted to do was this big project to kind of, um, what we want to do is show people and kind of promote how much we have going on in the neuroscience department here. Um, and there was two questions we were asked over and over and over. The first question was, how are you guys gonna do this? Um, and we can get to that later. Uh, the other question was, why Maine? Um, and I still get this question uh, every so often uh, nowadays. So why Maine? Many of you may have heard of Fred Hare. He is a two alum uh, from 65. He was not a neuroscience major when he was in school, as the field of neuroscience was not that uh, prestige yet and was not that well known. He was a biology major, but he went on and started a company called FHC, Fred Heron Corporation, where he works on research and manufacturing um, neurological devices. And these neurological devices are used in deep brain stimulation and it is a type of surgery to help those with Parkinson, uh, epilepsy, and that of the sort. So we wanted to show Teal how we were connected still to FHC. Because Fred Hare, he gives um, many, many endorsements and as much help to Teal as he possibly can. One, he brought the Neuromodulation Center, which some of you may have heard, to Greenville. And it's down on uh, Main Street. And also the Neuromodulation Services where they are connected internationally to different doctors and different firms helping with this deep brain stimulation. Um, so the people around the world are getting help from here in Greenville. And we also, as the neuroscience department, are working uh, with these facilities with internships, scholarships, and Fred Hare also helps with the research symposium and a lot of the uh, science-related research that we do here on campus. So we wanted to show people um, both on campus and alum how deeply rooted this connection was and we decided why not ride our bikes up to Maine from the Neuromodulation Center and from Teal where Fred Hare started all the way to his company that he started in Maine. So that is the connection between the locations. Um, as you saw up here, these are some like flash photos that we took along the trip. So day one we started right here in Teal and we rode up to uh, Mercyhurst College. And we had some generous connections there that hosted a facility for us to sleep in for the first night um, for free. And they were kind to us and gave us a nice big room that we were able to like work on our bikes, make all the repairs, both mentally and physically, and for our bikes. Because um, day one was probably the roughest day. And then day two, we rode from Mercyhurst to some farm in New York. Um, <laughs> I don't exactly remember the name of the town, but it was a uh, friend of Martin's who hosted us for the night. So he brought us into, onto his property. Um, he grilled for us. He cooked food for us. Uh, he had water and refreshments ready for us. It was a 95-mile day. 
and the first day was only about 70, 75 miles. So we already upped our mileage for the day, and we were very, very exhausted. Um, and then we rode from his farm through the rolling hills of New York, which is a very, very fun time when you're on a bicycle, um, and we made it to Canandaigua. When we made it to Canandaigua, New York, uh, this is where we met uh, Joe Nair. Nair. Um, he was a TEAL alum from 79, who is now, uh, he has a position at the Figure Lakes Community College um, for their advancement program. So he was generous enough that he saw TEAL College was coming to his town. Um, he hosted a site for us on their campus where we were actually able to tent and camp out, if you saw some of those pictures. Um, and it was a beautiful campus, uh, really awesome facility. He gave us a tour while we were there, took us out for dinner, he was very generous. Um, he was also the guy who networked us to the local YMCA. So where, why we connected with the YMCA is because we wanted to talk to kids and talk to different youth groups about one, bike safety, and two, what everyday common exercise can do for your brain. So we were riding our bikes and we were engaged in physical activity, a lot of physical activity, um, the entire trip. And we wanted to show kids <laughs> what that kind of uh, activity could do for their brains and do for their health. Um, and so we had a demonstration, I had a couple pictures there. Um, we tossed a balloon around and talked about motor coordination, we talked about just being uh, active and keeping your mind sharp and being able to make uh, conscious moves, which you have to do on a bike a lot as you're passing cars, uh, you have obstacles on the road, you're riding side to side at like 14, 15 mile an hour, so you constantly gotta be watching those things and engaging in motor activity. So we kind of showed that to the kids as well. Um, and then on from there, we you know, had that one day off, sort of. And so we started riding again. And each day, we roughly averaged, I'd say, 80 miles uh, per day, if not 90, if not more. There was one day, which is probably one of the most memorable days for myself. Um, <coughs> there was a group of us who rode 101 miles in one day. I think it took 10 hours, 11 hours, somewhere around there. Um, <coughs> beautiful morning, beautiful day, not such a great evening. We hit a storm, it was rainy, we took a break. Uh, we stood there for like 45 minutes trying to figure out communication where everyone was because we didn't stay together as one complete group the whole way through. It's kind of a difficult thing, everyone moves at different paces, something happens to the bike. You know, you just want to chug along. You find that one partner you stick with and you go with them. So, uh, myself, Hunter Young, Frank Jackson, Vince, uh, Ohali who's here, and Cody Wagner were five. We stopped at a Lowe's and got some coverage from the rain. We were kind of getting chilly. We weren't sure if we should go on or not. <laughs> so we stood there for about 45 minutes. We figured out the communication. We figured out how much farther we had to go. And we're like, you know what? Well, let's go for it. And we're like, we'll just wait here until it finally clears up a little bit. Well, we got tired of waiting. We hopped on our bikes and started going. The moment we start pedaling, it starts pouring down rain. Oh. So it was the worst timing ever, but you know, we're going on the road, stopping at the red lights with cars behind us wondering why we're on our bikes in the middle of the road, in the middle of the rain, in the middle of a storm. But uh, we trudged through and we just kept riding and we kept telling ourselves, 30 more miles, 30 more miles, 30 more miles, which seems crazy, but like we just kept doing it. And that's what we tell ourselves, regardless how close or how far we really were. Um, we just kept telling ourselves that. And then finally we get to this long bridge and then there's this huge, um, I forget the name of the hotel now, I don't know why. Big blue sign, white lettering. Travel um, Lodge. Yeah, the Travel Lodge. So we knew that was our hotel. The moment we saw that sign, we knew we made it, and we just all started cheering, going crazy and excited, because we just rode 100 miles to our destination through the rain, through the storm. And it was a phenomenal feeling. Um, and then, you know, we go to sleep and we wake up and we have to do it again. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't much of a relief, I guess, to say. But so we ride on. We get through New York, we finally make it to Vermont. We were all excited, took a picture, took a selfie with a sign, if you saw that one. Um, kept riding, go through the hills, we see Mount Killington. Uh, we had a few riders, uh, Martin and Fred Kaiser included, that didn't stop at the hotel, they wanted to hit the top of Mount Killington first. Because we all thought we were gonna get a nice ride down at the end and the hotel would be there. <coughs> we were actually on the front face of the mountain. So we had to stop for the night, keep climbing the mountain in the morning, go on. Well they said no, we're going to the top first and we'll come back. Um, so they went to the top and they took their victorious selfie at the top of the mountain, kept riding, kept going on, 
Uh, we made it to New Hampshire, which was not the friendliest roads or people to say that we met along the trip because we did meet some fascinating people at the different diners, different places we had dinner, and even the gas stations we stopped at for a few minutes. People were amazed by our story because everyone would ask, where are you guys riding from? They saw these bright yellow shirts, say a Teal College, oh, where's that at? We're like, Pennsylvania. And they're like, no, really, where are you riding from? We're like, no, Pennsylvania, it's been a long day. Um, so, and we also, so, and we met some people um, along the trip that just amazed us because um, if I remember correctly, it was one in seven people that have a neurological disorder sometime in their life. So maybe not now with our age group, but from this room that means, you know, we'd have up to two or three people in this room that would have a neurological disease within their life. And it surprises us because along the trip, people would see our shirt and see the word neuroscience, or we'd tell them a quick gist about what we're doing, and they'd be like, no way. Like, we met, I uh, can't remember certain cases, but we met um, three or four people that had multiple neurological disorders that they were dealing with at their time, right then and there. It was fascinating, and they loved it. We had one guy who, after we told him the story, we just met him at a gas station. I was not one of the ones who got to meet him. Um, he donated. He donated to our cause and our fund online right then and there because he was fascinated with it and he wanted to help out. So it was really touching. It was really amazing. Um, so we ride. We finally see the ocean. And we finally see Maine. And we made it to FHC. We got to meet. Fred Hare, he took us out and we had lobster because that is the most victorious dinner you can possibly have. <laughs> and it was probably the best lobster I will ever have. I don't even want to try it again because I don't want to be let down from that feeling I had that day. Um, and it was just amazing and we got to meet some amazing people. Um, we actually had one guy who broke down uh, on the bike, which is, you know, it just falls apart. It's not like your car breaks down. Um, so when you can't ride on, you kind of just got to wait for the shag wagon. So we had a van riding with us that would pick us up meet us every 15 miles for lunch or snacks or water. Um, so he was out there, it was kind of like foggy, kind of rainy, um, and he got picked up by a stranger, or offered help from a stranger. Um, this lady, I can't remember the name of the disorder. Um, oh, do you remember? Um, I, I can't remember, we didn't write it down, um, but she's, had, she's faced problems all her life uh, with her spine and with different disorders, and it's a very, very rare disease. Well, she actually was the one who picked up Frank and took him back to uh, her farm. You know, she was very kind, she was very generous, and then brought him back to us. Um, and it was all friendly, it wasn't like this crazy, like, oh my God, that we should never let this happen type of deal. Um, it was, you know, everyone was mindful of what was going on, and uh, she was a very nice lady. And we actually, on our way back, because we did not ride our bikes back to Teal, we got a, nice van ride and we saw Martin's car covered in like 15 bikes. Um, we came back and we actually stopped at her house for a quick lunch break and um, she told us our sto her story again and got to meet her and she has stayed in contact with Frank to this day. So she was really glad what we were doing. It really touched her as well. So um, that's all I have. you guys have any questions? Any questions about the funny pictures? <laughs> I know there's a couple of laughs there. Um, I might have missed it, but how many days did it take you to get all the way up to Maine? So it took, it was a 14 day trip. <coughs> okay. But it was about 10 and a half days of riding. We did take days off every like three days. We'd take a day off just for rest and for the outreach program that we had. Um, we wanted to, every day off, have um, presentations with the YMCA's. But besides Canandaigua, we weren't able to further uh, get any open slots or really um, find time in those towns that we were going to be at. It was kind of hard to um, designate those times and really commit to like making it exactly that far, exactly that time. But at least we did get the one outreach program. And I mean, the YMCA, they were awesome and generous people too. Any other questions? Robert. How did you guys physically and mentally prepare yourself for um, that's another very common question that we get. What did you do to train? All of us will tell you, every last one of us didn't train at all. <laughs> there was a couple times we went out on a like 20 mile bike ride. That's not training for an 800 mile bike trek. Um, it's, you just, we got on the bike in the morning, 
and just went. We just started riding, you know, the first like 10 to 15 miles, you feel it in your legs. But after that, they kind of go numb, you stop feeling your butt, <laughs> you just ride. <laughs> Listen to music, have conversation, talk, and just enjoy the view the whole time. Um, and then a lot of Snickers bars, chocolate, <laughs> you wanted sugar, you wanted energy, you wanted chocolate, and peanut butter jellies the whole time. So we just mouth those down and keep riding. Yeah. Who lost the most weight? <laughs> <laughs> we should have had a, a poll for that. Who lost the most weight? I honestly don't know. We, gain, we all gained weight. Yeah, I think we all. We, we gained more than we actually wrote. <laughs> you should see the breakfast pill. Just the breakfast pill. From every morning, all the pancakes. And That's right. Lumberjack's lunch. What part of Maine did you go into? Okay, so it was the town is Bowdoin, Maine. Okay. Um, it's kind of hard to explain Maine. The one I'm not from there. But. Um, it is pretty, it's not very central Maine, it's still in like the lower, like southeast area, but it's not right at the border either, because we all thought it was, and we're like, no, we still have like 80 more miles into Maine, and we're like, okay, we can do it, we've already made it this far, but the town is Bowdoin, Maine, um, it's a little uh, north of Portland, and then the other town right this way. Yeah, Bowdoin College is in Portland, <coughs> which is kind of confusing, mm -hmm. Bowdoin itself kind of a rural village. It's a very rural town and uh, we actually missed the place we were supposed to go to. I, I, okay, I personally missed the place by like three miles at a time. Just because I kept riding and kept riding. I was so excited to get there and pass the place. And <laughs> 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 I called it, I called it. So, uh, but yeah, it was very joyous. I mean, we didn't stay together the whole time just because it was really hard, but um, we came out with more stories and more friendships than like we went in. A lot of us didn't even know each other besides like seeing each other's faces in class or so. But I mean, we're all together now. We still have the club going, and we plan on doing another trip like so in the future. So, yes. all right. thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was wonderful. Our senior Jennifer Shelley is back from her student teaching experience. And she is one of our Bonner Hines scholarship recipients. She spent this past summer in Thailand as a volunteer teacher for a month. She will discuss such aspects of her trip as her homestay family, teaching, the culture of Thailand, and very significantly how her experience changed her. I'm happy to welcome Jennifer, who will share with us her summer in Thailand, the land of smiles. Jennifer. Thailand. Um, I lived in the guest house next to my family's house. 
So I, there was a couple other Americans that came and went while I was there, so I got to meet other Americans from other states, which was really cool. Um, and pictured here is my Thai family. Um, in the top right is my host mom and my host grandma. And the bottom one is my host mom, my host grandma, um, the maid's son, and my host aunt. So sometimes they invited family over to meet us and like have dinners. And the host family is really what made or break the experience. My host family was amazing. Um, the mealtime really was like something you don't experience in America because mealtime with families here is not what it used to be. But it was really cool to experience family time and having like sitting down and having a sit down meal with your family and really like just talking with your family and like spending time with each other. So that was a really cool experience. Um, they taught me a lot about the language and religion, which was really cool because I got time to actually like learn about the Thai culture. Um, and I also got time to talk with other volunteers and like get to know them as well. So meeting people from all over the world was a really cool experience. So I was there to teach. That was my main goal, to teach in an elementary school. I taught English lessons all day long. I bopped around to different classrooms of different age levels and taught. So the school day started at 8 a.m. with a brain activation assembly where they all sat outside and the school director led a brain activation assembly. Couldn't tell you what went on because I didn't know the language, but I could see them moving their hands and doing different activities. Um, and then they had hour-long classes, which I thought was really long for elementary school, so that was definitely a huge change because you cannot keep kindergarten focused for an hour. It doesn't happen. And then they ended their school day at 2.30, but the kids weren't allowed to leave. So from 2.30 to 3.30, if they weren't involved in the club, they had to stay and play and socialize with other kids, and I thought that was really crucial because obviously we learn through play a lot, especially at the younger age, and so like seeing the kids staying after school and socializing with each other was really cool. Um, the discipline and the education program blew my mind because they hit the kids with whatever they could find to hit the kids with. And when I was in the classroom, I was the only one in there sometimes, and like I just could not bring myself to do that, to discipline them. And I didn't know the language enough to tell them what not to do or what to do. So it was really difficult for me to like discipline them and keep them controlled. And I just couldn't bring myself to hit them because I could see the way they acted when the teachers did that and how they flinched. And I just couldn't do that. Um, and it was really weird to see the teachers didn't really discipline the older kids. They're kind of in charge of your education. So if you're out in the classroom, like passing notes, throwing spitballs, jumping off of desks, like they didn't care. Like if you don't learn, that's your fault. They don't really do anything about that. So that was really hard to adjust to. And you can see in the pictures they have uniforms. The school I was at is run by the military. Um, and so the military. The head guy is like the school director type of guy and he kind of like runs all their assemblies and like runs the school. So that was kind of cool to see like the military in charge. Um, and my school is on a military base and in the picture we were in like an assembly room um, that's run by the military. And the picture is also from Teacher Appreciation Day which was really cool. Um, the kids come up on stage and bow down to the teachers and give them flowers. Um, and teachers are appreciated tremendously in Thailand. Uh, you walk around the sidewalks, you walk through the classrooms, kids are constantly bowing to the teachers, saying hello teacher, good morning teacher, um, and their teachers are just very high in society in Thailand, and that was very cool to see, because here teachers don't really get the appreciation that they deserve. And so being there on Teacher Appreciation Day was really a cool experience. And here are just some pictures from teaching. On the left, I'm in the kindergarten classroom teaching alphabet to a small group, and on the right was my last day in kindergarten with the kindergartner teacher and my friend Pin, that was a student teaching there, is on my right. So that was a kindergarten class. And they're adorable, if you can't tell. <laughs> and here's some more pictures. Top left is also a kindergarten student. She was my favorite, even though I shouldn't pick favorites. <laughs> but she was always listening and she always she was very, very bright too. Um, and the right top right is fourth grade. And bottom left is me teaching occupations to kindergarten. And then bottom right is fourth grade group picture my last day. And I'm holding a frame that they all like wrote their names, but they're obviously like their English nicknames, so they're really funny. <laughs> um, the only time I had off of teaching was weekends, so that was the only time I had sightseeing. So I didn't really get to do a whole lot of traveling across the country. Um, so my weekends I spent in Bangkok because there were so many places in Bangkok that you could travel and look around and see things that that was basically what I did. 
And I also went one weekend to Ayutthaya, which was really interesting because I met a girl from Thailand at Pitt on our Bayer Heinz retreat, and her sister happened to be in the same community that I was living in. So we actually met up, and she took me to Ayutthaya, which was an hour away, and showed me around. So it was really cool to like meet someone from America, that lives in America now, and I like connected with her family in Thailand when I was there. So small world, it was really cool. Um, and I also visited temples and palaces, which on the right, that is at Wat Po, which is one of their biggest temples, and it's in Bangkok, and that is Big Buddha, made of pure gold. And you can see, you can't really see in this picture, but you can see the shoulder of the person in the bottom right, so you can tell how huge this monument is. And I also went to a couple of museums. And what's really cool about the sightseeing in Thailand is that the museums and temples and palaces is free to Thai people. So you only have to pay if you're a tourist. So all my Thai friends could go with me and my Thai family and they get in for free. And I told them how in America, like if you go to Washington DC like, and you go to different monuments and museums, you still have to pay to get in even though you're American. So they like could not believe that. So it was really cool. And here's a couple other pictures. On the left is Buddha image. Um, notice how the people are kneeling with their feet, feet pointed back. Um, and they're like going to be bowing down and praying to Buddha. And on the right is called Dusset Palace. And then here's just some others. Um, the left is Golden Mountain, which was 300 steps to get to the top, so it was very far up. Um, and the middle is from Ayutthaya, and those are temples that were burned by Burma when Burma invaded Thailand way, way back. And um, there's another picture of me riding an elephant, <laughs> which was really cool. Um, there's a lot of culture differences I had to experience. Um, eating was the biggest one. I don't eat spicy food very well and it doesn't agree with me. So I learned how to say no spice the first day I got there. Um, you, they eat everything off of the spoon, so you use the fork to put the food onto the spoon and then eat off the spoon. The fork never goes in your mouth. So it was very hard for me to do because I'm like, I don't know how to eat this big piece of chicken with a spoon. <laughs> and then when you're done, you place your fork and silverware next to each other on top of the plate. And that was more for like at home when the maid knew when to take our plate away. Um, the greeting is called away. You put your hands together and you bow down. Um, and I just found a McDonald's guy on the street. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and in Thai culture, they don't really confront each other. They don't talk about their problems or the issues. Everything is hush hush. Um, I asked about the king one time, and they like really like hushed it down because they don't like to talk about their politics because they're going through a huge political disagreement right now. And even with people, if they have like if people are arguing like that, you don't see that happen. Everything's just hush hush. Um, time is really relaxed over there because the traffic is so crazy. If you want to meet at 1:30 and the person doesn't show up till two, like no one talks of it like it's fine and then another huge cultural differences was you take your shoes off before entering anything and that's a very old traditional thailand thing they do um, because in the olden days it was to keep the hygiene and keep inside clean and so it was very hygienic to remove your shoes and so you remove that before you go into restaurants schools temples palaces you're pretty much barefoot anytime you're not walking the streets and my worst experience was this, was in school, I removed my shoes before entering the classroom every day. And I was in a kindergarten classroom with kids that weren't potty trained. And I stepped in a big pile oh, of no. poop, <laughs> barefoot, didn't see it, great experience. And the teachers didn't know English, so I had to show them my foot so they could show me the bathroom so I could clean off. And so that was the best experience with my shoes off. <laughs> and the traffic was just crazy. Um, there's like, it's backed up for miles all the time. It took me 45 minutes to get five miles to my school every day. And um, they have motorcycle taxis, which I never got on because I saw way too many accidents. They just like weave in and out wherever they want to go. Um, if you've ever seen The Hangover 2, that's in Bangkok. Just watch that, pretty much what I experienced. <laughs> the traffic, awful. Um, they have buses, public transportation. Um, the Sky Train, which is like a train that's kind of like building level, and then they have like a subway type thing. So I took the bus every day to school because I was never getting on the back of a motorcycle, so it was very scary. And here are some friends I met. Um, these are the teachers that I worked at my school that I got to be best friends with. I actually cried leaving because we just got really close my last two weeks there. We hung out every day after school. They took me to dinner all the time. 
Um, and like the Thai people are so friendly, they love to smile. Like I walk to school and I pass by the same motorcycle taxi guys every morning and they always greeted me and said hello in Thai and in English. And they like love to just see me every day. So it was really cool to like go to a country and like feel welcomed because they wanted you to be there. They wanted you to experience their amazing culture and it was really cool. So these people I still talk to today, like every day, we like message each other, talk to each other. So it was really awesome. Um, this ex experience changed me completely. Um, it changed my view on other cultures and the world. Um, it taught me how to be more open to others because of how I was treated in a new country. That's how I want other people to feel when they come to this country. It was an amazing experience to not be glared at, to not be like completely left out. Like they included me, they wanted me to learn about their culture, so that was really awesome. And I learned how to find common areas of interest with other people. Like I learned how to relate to others that aren't from the same area as me. Learn how to relate and talk to others that don't have the same language as me. Like you really learn how to get around the differences because everyone is similar in some sort of way and you just gotta get past the differences and find your similarities with everyone. And the communication and language barrier was a huge one that I had to get past and it was a really, really cool idea, cool smart way to like learn how to communicate with others that you don't have any similar language with. And it also taught me that I should like try and welcome foreigners more into the States rather than like watch them keep being in their own little world, like try to welcome them because that's how I was when I went to Thailand and I want other people to feel that way when they come to America. And here's my blog if anyone wants to take a picture of it. I blog like once a day, twice a day. Um, there's a lot on there. So I was there for a month so there's probably like 35 to 50 posts I think. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes? How did you teach if you didn't know Thai? So what I did is I did pictures on the board with words. So I drew shapes and I actually made like index cards before I went and took them with me. So I made like shapes with a name on them and then I put it on the board and then I passed out the shapes to the kids and I would point to the shape and say square. And then the kids with a square in their hand had to come up and say square and hand me the picture. I did the same thing with colors and I did body parts. Like I just stood them up, we pointed to our body parts. So yeah, pretty much associating pictures with words, speaking it. Anybody else? Robert? What was one of your favorite phrases you learned to say in Um, My favorite probably is Swadi Ka. It means hello. You, swadi Ka. Swadi Ka. Swadi Ka. Yeah. It means hello. You say good, goodbye, hello, welcome, pretty you much. Yes, you have to bow. You always bow to the person that's older. Yes. So like the students bowed to me, but I didn't bow to them. And like my grandma, every morning I came out, she was in her wheelchair soaking up the sun. So that's what he called to her every night, it's like a night to her, so yeah. That's so cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I, I have a question about teachers hitting students. <laughs> that just doesn't sit well with me. Um, and I, I come from a culture where teachers did that too, and they usually used um, rulers, and they would just slap you mm -hmm. with the rulers on the head. Um, do they have any rules as to what they can hit, like where do they hit and how um, hard? Or see, I don't know because the teachers didn't speak English. There was two in the entire school that spoke English, and mm -hmm. they're still like weren't very fluent. I only saw them with like rubberish rulers, okay. and they had these like they almost looked like long straws, but I never touched it because I was not getting anywhere near it. Um, they looked like long straws that they just whacked them with, and I only saw them hit them on the arm and the leg. Okay. But sometimes they did leave marks, like this one time this teacher took the student and like rubbed water on their arm to try to get rid of the mark. So, yeah. do, do the parents know about that? Or um, do you think? I have no idea. It's a private school I know <laughs> and the parents pay for their kids to go there so I think they're probably okay with it if they keep sending their kids there and keep paying for it. So. Because kids would probably <coughs> tell their parents. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea. It was very hard to get past that because I just want to be like, no, don't do that. But yeah, anybody else? All right. Oh, go ahead. What was your favorite Thai food that you like? Mango and sticky rice. <laughs> it was a dessert, I know, but I ate it every time I could. Um, so it's sticky rice, and it's not like normal rice. Like you can't make normal rice sticky. It's an actual brand of sticky rice and um, it gets cooked and then you warm coconut milk with sugar and you soak that together for 20 minutes and then you just cut the mango and serve them together. It's delicious. All right, anyone else? 
Thank you. our presenters today. They did a wonderful job. Thank you for your preparation, for your travels, and thank you for returning to us. I also want to say we're going to have two forums uh, in October. October 13th, we're going to have a, a Teal Forum Special Edition, and faculty, staff, students are certainly welcome to attend that one. It will be titled Mindset Part 2, uh, and it will be about effective pedagogical techniques that can be used in the classroom to uh, heighten student awareness and to increase uh, productivity in the classroom. So that would be for all of us October 13th. The next one, our regular Teal Forum, will be October 20th, and that will feature our psychology professor, Dr. Shannon Dietz, who will talk on altered consciousness, our senior student, Nate Flory, and his summer experiences in England, and our biology professors, Dr. Albert Delbert, Abby Abdallah, and Fatimata Pale, and their travels to Africa with some of our students this past summer. So don't forget to come to those, certainly, and invite your friends to them, and enjoy more ice cream cake. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Great job.